This barber was cutting a client's hair, and he looked up and saw this young boy coming across the street, and he told the guy in the chair, he says, you got to look at this kid. He's the dumbest kid you've ever met. He says, every time he comes, I offer him either two quarters or a dollar. He always takes the two quarters. He says, just watch this. So the boy comes in, and the barber puts two quarters in one hand and a dollar in the other, and says, which do you want, kid? And the kid takes the two quarters and runs out. He says, he always comes back twice a day, always takes the two quarters, never takes the dollar. And so later that afternoon, uh, the boy came back, and one of the other barbers said, Son, why do you always take the two quarters instead of the dollar? And the boy said, Because I know as soon as I take the dollar, the game's over. <laughs> So just because we think somebody is, is not getting it, or just because we think somebody is not with it, uh, they will surprise us. And when we're in this passage where once again the, the Pharisees are coming against Jesus, and we can say, ah, they're so dumb, they're so stupid, they don't get it. I mean, Jesus is talking plainly. This is continuation of the Feast of Tabernacles, where Jesus presented the living water, which is the Holy Spirit. And then he's teaching in the courtyard of the temple, and they come and they bring this woman caught in adultery. And he reflects back on them their sin, as opposed to the sin of the women, woman. And in this passage, we're told that Jesus is in the treasury. Uh, the treasury was a section of the temple where offerings were collected. There's a passage where Jesus is observing the givings of the offering, and a widow comes and puts in two mites. And that was the treasury. It isn't where they kept the money. It was a little private courtyard area where offerings were collected, where people could come any time during night and day. And Jesus says that he is the light of the world. This is another I am statement. And he says this in opposition to the darkness of the Pharisees or the darkness of the world. Uh, classically speaking, the, the theme of light and dark is throughout the Bible. And darkness means without God and without God's truth. So if somebody is operating in their own philosophy, if somebody doesn't look to the Bible for what to do, then we would say, Jesus would say, that they are living in darkness. And therefore, light is understanding and believing in God's truth in Jesus Christ. Uh, this is therefore an idiom. This is a figure of speech. Uh, today we would say darkness would be those who are unsaved without Jesus Christ and those with Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, are in light. Uh, why does darkness look this way, or why does Jesus use the, the imagery of darkness? Uh, a little historical perspective might say that. Uh, back in the 500s, uh, after Rome fell, we say that the time that Europe was in was the Dark Ages, and the Dark Ages gave way to the medieval ages, and the medieval gave way to renaissance, and here we are today. It's called the Dark Ages because when Rome fell in 476, uh, something that was unforeseen happened. What had happened while Rome was in power was they set up schools everywhere. In every little town there was a tutor, there was a teacher, in Rome itself there was universities, there was opportunities for anybody to go and learn the, the Greek philosophies, to learn chemistry and mathematics, and to learn the great things of the world. And when Rome fell, the government stopped putting money into schools, and if you're a teacher and you're not getting paid, well, you're going to go find another job. So all the schools, over time, shut down. And if you wanted to learn how to read, if you wanted to read the great classics. There was no longer a place to do it. 
And as the educated generation passed away and the kids grew up to be farmers, uh, they didn't know how to read, most of them. Most of them had books in the house and, and didn't know what to do with them because the parents were so dependent upon the Roman government for the education. And so we say it was dark ages because it was a darkness of understanding. It was a darkness of education. Europe, after Rome fell, actually became more ignorant. We could say they became dumber over time because they forgot all the great things, all the great body of knowledge that Rome had. And so when we speak of darkness in a spiritual sense, we aren't speaking about dumbness, but we are in many ways speaking about ignorance. Uh, people who live in darkness may not know who Jesus Christ is. Darkness could mean uh, just ignorance, they may not know. And that's one reason that we send missionaries all over the world. And the missionaries take with them Bibles because they educate the people in these foreign lands who Jesus Christ is. And for many of them who are in very difficult, devastating poverty situations, as soon as they gain a knowledge of Jesus Christ, they accept Jesus Christ, and there is a, a great success rate in simply educating people about who Jesus Christ is. The Whitecliffe Bible translators go one step further, and they say, for you to truly know who Jesus Christ is, and to gain this knowledge, you have to have a Bible in your native tongue. And so they are going to all these small little tribes all over the place, and we support missionaries who are translating the Bible into a Nigerian language, a Tagari or Kambari or some language that I don't remember, because only 125 people speak it. But they're making a Bible for them so they can have a closer relationship with God. On the other hand, there are people who know exactly who Jesus Christ is or know all about Jesus Christ, and we find this in more Western uh, countries where there is more wealth and more leisure time, uh, they just rebel. And they say, well, that's fine. Jesus Christ is that. I don't want anything to do with it because all Jesus Christ is is a set of rules or all Jesus Christ is is going to ruin my fun. So they know the name Jesus Christ. Perhaps they were raised in Sunday school. Perhaps they went to a church because they were dating a Christian, but that all fell apart. And they never got a true education, a true understanding, and they remain in darkness, and it is spiritual darkness. So Jesus is, is sparring with these Pharisees, and if you read these passages, they probably look familiar because there's three times in the book of John where Jesus says, I am this, and they say, you're only one man, your testimony is not true. In other words, they're sticking their fingers in their ears and humming because they don't want to know what Jesus Christ has to say. They don't say, what do you mean? They say, you're lying, basically, because there's one person making stuff up. And so there's a, a series of of very quick truths that Jesus throws at the Pharisees. Uh, he is not being an evangelist here, I guess is the best way to say it. His goal in sparring with the Pharisees in this passage is not to give them a deeper understanding of, of what God has done for them or who God is because he knows that they're perpetually in darkness it is more like him giving them enough rope so that they can prove themselves wrong, so that they can hang themselves. And the basic truth that he gives is that God the Father and God the Son uh, agree on everything. Uh, he, they say, we well, have no, what's your testimony and this, and he says, well, the Father has given me the testimony, and I... So everything that Jesus Christ and God the Father is doing is in 100% agreement. We understand this because 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God, three persons. We have a Trinity understanding of who God is. Back then, this was confusing to them. But so Jesus is saying that there are two people who, who believe in him, and that's God the Father and God the Son. And that Jesus is going back to heaven where he originally came from. Uh, there was an understanding that we have today that when people are born, uh, they are created for the first time. You are a new person. Uh, it isn't like you were in a holding bin somewhere and God plucked you out and, and put you. Uh, there are some religions who believe that spirits have been eternal from the past and that they keep coming into new bodies. But we believe that uh, when I was born, a new spirit, a new person, a new me was created. And so to say that I came from somewhere, well, that would be where I was born. You know, I came from Alameda. And I'm not going back there, but that's where I came from. And Jesus is saying, where he came from, and he's using a word that means way back, or originally, or his origins, and that can mean only heaven, because Jesus has existed for all of eternity, and when Jesus was born, the God the Son part of Jesus has been eternal and will continue on. The body of Jesus was brand new. But the person of Jesus had been eternal. So this is a, a strange teaching for the Pharisees that he, because they think, where did he come from? Well, he came from Nazareth, or he came from Galilee. A third is that the Pharisees are ignorant of all these things. Uh, he does say, uh, you don't know. He does say, you don't know what I'm talking about, and that is a true Understanding that the reason that they are ignorant is because they are in darkness, but they are also in rebellion because Jesus could get out a chalkboard and he could diagram the whole thing and he could, you know, hand out textbooks and do quizzes and, and teach them, and they will still want nothing to do with it because their rebellion was based in self protection. They had a system of manipulating the people with religion that was getting them to be very popular and very rich because people basically had to pay the Pharisees and pay the priests to get religious education. And they only told them what they wanted to tell them to manipulate them. What Jesus is offering, as we know today, uh, is a freedom, a freedom of understanding who God is. And this would, you know, if, if Christ is free, like we believe, uh, well, that would ruin the, the organized crime of organized religion uh, back in that day. And so they are rebelling out of self-protection, and that is keeping them in spiritual darkness. Then he says that those who, oh, those who are in darkness uh, judge according to the flesh, which means that they use their own biases, their own preferences, they are self-centered, they are selfish, and they only judge what benefits themselves. I have talked with all sorts of people when I used to work in the corporate arena. I would talk to all sorts of people about religion and religious ideas, and people who did not have Christian experience, people who were not seeking after Christ, would always describe religion as something self-benefiting, of what they could get out of it. Uh, of a way that some would say that religion is what governments use to put down other people. Some people say religion is only interested in your money. This, this idea that the whole thing about God is made up and that it's only there for self-benefit. And people who are in the world can only judge from personal biases. They can only judge based on what they like and what they don't like. There is no eternal, absolute truth to point to and say, this is right or this is wrong. And so people who have no spiritual understanding will judge according to their own experiences. And we say that they judge according to the flesh. And then the worst thing that Jesus could say, that is they didn't know the Father or the Son. So they... Uh, 
Stop the Pharisee on the street and say, who is God? And they would say, God is my father, and he's this, and they would talk about Moses, and they would talk about the law, and they would use very flowery, worshipful language to talk about this being that they call God. And what Jesus is saying is that is such a limited, in a box view of who God is, that God is willing and was doing anything and everything he could to restore his relationship with you. And to see God as nothing but a list of rules is ignorant. And they were not willing to step out of that box because it was so profitable, it was so comfortable to have God be nothing but a list of rules because they knew that if they did this, God was happy, and if they did that, God was mad. And that was a very simple understanding of who God is. And Jesus is saying that is all wrong. And so this idea of darkness uh, and light has continued throughout the New Testament. Uh, Paul in Galatians and Ephesians in Romans 6, 7, and 8 in various other parts of the New Testament. The uh, idea of the flesh is given for the unsaved. Jesus says darkness, Paul would say the flesh, and that is the same thing. So we say people who are living in the flesh are those who are who have no spirit, their spirit is dead, all they have is the flesh, and we would say they are unsaved. And that the light is walking according to the spirit. And so in Galatians 4, 5, and 6, Paul's talking about uh, make choices of living in the spirit, not in the flesh. And Jesus in this passage would say, make choices in the light, not in the darkness. And so, how does somebody become uh, in the light? How does somebody walk in the spirit? Well, the first thing you have to do is accept Jesus Christ. You believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. At that moment, the Holy Spirit moves into you. Your spirit is regenerated or reawakened or comes alive. You can then walk in the spirit. You can then walk in the light because the light of Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, is in you. And if you reject all that or if you say you don't know all that, you're doing the best you can, you are walking in darkness or you are walking in the flesh. So we live in a society we live in a world where some of us are walking in the light and a lot of us are walking in the darkness. And we bump into each other all the time. Light and darkness bumps into each other. I don't think it is like Cecil B. DeMille said in the Ten Commandments. If you remember the Ten Commandments with Charles Heston and the plague of darkness came it was a wall of darkness where it was daylight over here and dark, dark darkness over here. I don't think the world is reflecting that way. I think there's a lot of shadow and there's a lot of greater. And darkness has invaded our governments. It has invaded our schools. It has invaded our churches. It has invaded our entertainment. Where there are reasonings that the flesh is the best way to think. And we will bump up against that. Eleanor Roosevelt first said, it is better to light one little candle than to curse the darkness. What does that mean for us? Well, it means it's impossible to change the darkness. I can go to the darkness and I can yell at it. I can read scripture to the darkness. I can do all sorts of things to the darkness. And the darkness does not have within it the power to become light. The darkness only knows the darkness. The flesh only knows the flesh. The way that you change or the way that you move darkness out of the way is your replacement. If you are experiencing the forces of darkness, the darkness of the world in your life, the only way to move that from dark to light is by Jesus Christ, is by introducing people to Jesus Christ. And that's why 
when we send missionaries all around the world, that's why they take Bibles with them, because they are replacing the ignorance with truth. They are replacing the flesh with the spirit. They are replacing the darkness with light. Darkness does not have within itself, no matter how logical you are in explaining it to the darkness, darkness does not have within it the ability to understand what you're saying and to change into light. The only way to move from darkness to light is to put Jesus Christ in the situation. Jesus Christ will replace the darkness from the light. Another problem that we can have is, especially in church, we got a good thing going in our church. We have a wonderful church. Our church is not the light, however. I am not the light. I am, at best, a moon. I reflect the light. Some days I'm not even a very good moon. But if I get published, if I get a TV show, if I begin to do things, I can say, well, look at me, because I am the light. That is a problem. When Christians believe that they have become the light, they will fail at every ministry they try. The best that we can do is reflect the light, and the thing that we can do in every situation is we can introduce the darkness of Jesus Christ. We can say, darkness, Jesus, Jesus, darkness, and let Jesus do all the work. Why? Because he's the light, I'm not the light. And if you want to destroy ministry, if you want to split churches, if you want to destroy churches, begin having people in that church stand up and say, they are the light. They are the focus. They are the thing that make things work. It has been said that there are two basic reasons people don't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. The first is they have never been a Christian, and the second is they've been a Christian. Uh, sometimes Christians are not the greatest influencer because we pull out a little flashlight say, look, I'm the light. Woo, I'm the light. When Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's brighter than the sun. He is more light than you can ever imagine. And as soon as I say that it's my ministry, or it's my this, or it's my that, I know a pastor who says, I don't save anybody because if I save people, i got to keep them. Uh, Jesus Christ saves people because he has the power to keep them. Uh, he has the power to keep you. All I can do at most is be a reflection of his light. I can point you to Jesus. I can say, hey, look, here's Jesus over here. And let Jesus do all the heavy lifting. We live in a time in which it seems like darkness is winning. Darkness is not winning. Darkness is just the default state. When you get home today, lights aren't on, the default state of your house is in darkness. The default state of the world is darkness. Darkness doesn't fight the light, darkness just is there. And we need to show the world Jesus Christ, we need to show the world who Jesus Christ is, and when we're called to do stuff, we need to reflect as best as we can the light of Jesus Christ in the darkness and replace the darkness with light. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise you for, for all the great things that you're doing in the world. I praise you for continuing to love us, for continuing to shine on us, that we may reflect your light. Lord, we praise you for your love for this world. We praise you for your love for us. We thank you for all the great things you're doing, and as your blessing upon the remainder of the day. We ask this in the blood of Christ. Amen.